Mechs aren't hiding in dark alleys waiting to jump you, but you should know about them. Hello and welcome to the Durham Talents channel. My name is Jesse Durham. For today's installation in our Encyclopedia series, we're going to discuss Mechs, Modified Endowment Contracts. Let me begin by describing what a MEC is. Again, it's a Modified Endowment Contract, and you'll see it abbreviated as an MEC. And it is still a policy. It is still a contract from a life insurance company. It's one that on or after June 21st, 1988, that fails the seven pay test. And we'll discuss that also in a minute. And that'll be as described in the 7702A section of the IRS code. So let's talk about this seven pay test. It's a calculation of how much premium it would take to pay up the death benefit over a seven-year period. So it's how much premium it would take to pay up for the death benefit over a seven-year period. And to be able to stay below that limit is to just remain a whole life insurance policy. And I'm saying a whole life insurance policy because here on our channel, of course, we're talking about how to implement the infinite banking concept as described, conceived, codified in R. Nelson Nash's book, Becoming Your Own Banker. So we're going to be using properly structured whole life policies from mutual companies that pay dividends. We are typically going to want to remain simply a whole life policy, not a mech for banking purposes. Although, here in a moment, we're going to discuss how mechs can be very useful into your legacy plans. So for banking purposes, it's possible that a policy can be funded to an extent or so much so that it changes into a modified endowment contract and it loses its tax favorable treatment when it comes to policy loans, for example. So when you're accessing capital from a mech, those distributions are taxed. And if it's prior to 59 and a half, you also have that 10% penalty, much like you'd experience with a qualified plan. So it loses some tax advantages as a mech. So for banking purposes, obviously we don't want that to be the case. We want to significantly fund whole life policies that we own and control for banking purposes, but not fund them so much so that we lose these tax advantages. We want to have tax free access to capital and you get that with policy loans. So just to recap some material here, when you pay premiums into a properly structured whole life policy that you intend to use for banking, the growth within the policy is tax deferred. Okay, the access that you have to capital from the company because you are a policy owner and you have these cash values that you can leverage, the access that you have to capital via policy loans leveraging your cash value are tax free. So you experience tax deferred growth within the policy by owning the policy, paying premiums, guaranteed growth, plus you can get dividends which all the companies that I own policies with and that we would use, they've paid dividends for over 100 consecutive years. Great. But we have tax-free access to capital via policy loans for the purposes of banking, paying off things, paying for things, financing things, whether that's something in our lifestyle or business, investments that we're looking to make, whatever the case may be. So, Having a policy that's significantly funded, but not so much that it loses its tax-favorable treatment. Now, the death benefit of a policy is always paid out income tax-free. So the death benefit is not going to be income taxed. Now, in real life, how I go about funding policies above and beyond paying my regular scheduled ongoing premiums is I also like to pay additional premiums into my policy. So at least once a year for each of my policies, I'm going to be calling the company or logging in to my portal and asking, finding out how much extra I can pay without making my policies. And I will find out that limit and I will pay up to that limit and not more. Now, if for whatever reason 
you do purposefully, intentionally pay more than you should have. The insurance company hopefully will be reaching out to you and, of course, asking, well, hey, did you mean to pay this much? Because that would mech this policy. That would turn it into a modified endowment contract. And that's, of course, a great chance for you to say, well, no, I didn't intend to do that. So the insurance company can reach out to you, of course, and let you know that and just simply send that check back so that you don't fund the policy to the point that it converts into a modified endowment contract because once a policy does become a modified endowment contract, it cannot then not be a modified endowment contract. So that is a one and done. Once a policy converts or changes into a modified endowment contract, it will remain a modified endowment contract until maturation, which is when you either turn 121 years old or you pass. Now here, let me make a point about the importance of having a robust, durable policy structure. Because in this space, it matters who you work with. It matters how policies are structured. Policies that have very little premium going to the base, the the foundation of the whole life policy itself, they are weaker. They're more fragile. Also, policies, and these are not wrong across the board. I'm not saying that. There are times where it's appropriate to have a term writer, let's say. But elements like having a small percentage of your premium, your overall premium going towards the base of a policy, or having a term writer, especially a short one, or having enhanced blended writers, or any combination of these different elements, perhaps especially if there's a combination where you have what some would call a skinny base, and then you have a term rider on top of that, or an enhanced blended rider. These add to the fragility of a policy, making it more likely that the policy will mech. So for the structure of your policy, having a robust and a strong base premium a percentage of your total premium going towards the base portion of the policy makes it more durable against that policy turning into a mech. Now, again, it's appropriate to have term riders. Every case is different. It can be appropriate to have term riders. I think that they should generally be long dated. Hopefully a convertible type as well, one that when you do not need it anymore on that policy for its purposes, its strategic purposes, that it was there for in the first place. Because again, that matters, that timing matters, that structure matters. But having one that could be converted to a whole life policy that's designed for banking purposes in the future, because again, that was something that you you strategized out. So again, that's why it's so important who you work with and how your policy is structured for your particular purposes so that it doesn't make and that it is strong and here for your whole life. Pun's always intended there. Now, when is a mech a good move? I did not know, always know this, of course. I've, I've not arrived. I'm still learning. I had been implementing infinite banking for years before I even ever heard someone talking about how a policy being converted into a mech was a great way to make sure that you could stuff however much capital, regardless of whether it would make that policy, perhaps even intentionally so, you could stuff more capital into that policy, into that piece of private property. Because remember this, folks, at the end of the day, when you and I graduate, when we pass, money can only go one of three places. It can go to our heirs and beneficiaries, individuals that we designate, it could go to nonprofits, churches, those types of organizations, or it can go to the government. So we could intentionally fund a policy so much so that in later life, we know that, yes, we would not have all the same tax advantages to be able to access capital, etc. And yet we can be putting that capital into a tax-free environment for the next generation because that death benefit will transfer because premium paid into a mech or not increases the death benefit, increases the cash value. And that death benefit is going to go 
tax-free, income tax-free to that next generation. So a MEC actually has a very strategic use for those that are implementing infinite banking. And again, when you remember that over the course of your lifetime, you're going to be building a system of policies. It may be strategic to start funding in a way, even if it makes a policy, to be able to see a smooth transfer of assets and capital from one generation to the next because of these private contracts that we own and control. So I hope that this has been helpful and insightful. If you still have remaining questions about modified endowment contracts, infinite banking, whole life insurance, then don't hesitate to put a comment in the comment section below. I will respond to that. Or you can speak directly with me at durhamtalents.com. This has been a great pleasure. I look forward to our next conversation. Have a great day. Take care.